We're live, one o'clock rock, with Manoa. What happens in Manoa? Research happens in Manoa. That's why our show at one o'clock rock on a Monday is Research in Manoa, R-I-M. We love this show. And today, an old-time guest, a guest who's been here many times, Peter McGinnis Mark, a researcher, director of the NASA Pacific Regional Planetary Data Center at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. What a mouthful. Wow, I can, <laughs> I can do it, I know I can do it. And we're talking today about, this is very exciting, the methane lakes of Titan. Yes, you're uh, going to learn something new today, Jay. Every I day bet with you, you <laughs> Do you even know where Titan is or what Titan really is? It's a moon of Jupiter. Well, close. Um, if we take a look at the first slide, Titan is a moon of Saturn. Oh, Saturn! Oh, All right. oh! A and do recognize... I, do I still pass the course? Not yet. Right. Um, recognize that Saturn is one of the four giant gas giant planets. Um, you can see here in this mosaic, which was taken way back in the late 70s by the Voyager spacecraft, Saturn is the planet with these wonderful rings. Um, it's got some fascinating moons associated with it. Uh, we only have time today to talk about one of them, um, but in the field of view, you see Rhea. Um, there's another small one called Enceladus with geysers made of water vapor. Um, the little small one, which looks like the Death Star, is Mimas. And then off to the top right, that is Titan, and that is the focus of today's presentation. Oh, this is a photograph? This is a computer montage. Ah. So the moons weren't all in the appropriate positions. Uh. So um, when the Voyager 2 spacecraft went by in 79, uh, we were able to take images of individual satellites, and then this is being computer montage, yeah. montage, photoshopped together. Yeah. But if we go on to the second slide, we will see this is the topic of today's discussion. Yes. We're going to talk about Titan, which is the orange fuzzy ball in the middle. Yes. And this is drawn to scale with Earth's moon on the right-hand side uh, and, the, and the largest moon in the solar system, which is called Ganymede. Uh, which I told you was, uh, I thought it was a, 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 a place in Scotland. Yeah? It could well be, could but it's be. also the largest moon in the solar okay, system, right. and it's a moon of Jupiter. All mm -hmm. right? So we won't deal with Ganymede today or with Earth's moon, but this image shows First of all, the relative sizes. Yes. So Titan is the second largest moon in our solar system. But it's unique for a couple of reasons. The jury has a question. How big is big? You know, are these relative moons big in miles or kilometers? All right. So our moon mm -hmm. is about the same size diameter as an airplane flight from San Francisco to Washington, D.C. Okay, so That's that 3, miles. is about 3,000 3, miles. miles. Okay. So if we were to see the, the scale drawing or scale pictures, uh, you can get some idea that Titan is about 4,500 miles across. Circumference or cross? Diameter. A, a not, diameter, okay. Not circumference. Um, but Titan is unique in the solar system in that it is the only moon in our solar system that has an atmosphere, or a thick atmosphere at least. It's so thick, in fact, that it's twice as dense as the Earth's atmosphere, mm -hmm. and it's made of a wonderful mixture of hydrocarbons. So it's got methane and ethane uh, in the atmosphere. And you can, you can tell from the picture, because you can look at the, what the optics. Uh, the, the spectral, the spectral properties imaging and all of, that. of the atmosphere will tell you the composition of the atmosphere. And we know from those measurements that it's predominantly methane and ethane and a few other exotic hydrocarbons. So it's not oxygen and nitrogen like Earth's atmosphere. Yes. But the other thing about Titan is that it's really, really cold. So it's so cold, its surface temperature is about minus 180 degrees centigrade. So that is probably about minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, that's not easy to get around in It's that. not easy to get around there. And so you've got this wonderful world it's got a higher gravity than Earth's moon, it's got a thick atmosphere, and it's got a whole series of exotic chemistries in the atmosphere as well. Yes, but why does it have an atmosphere like that? What happened as opposed to what happened on the moon or on the Jupiter moon? What a great question. Funny you should ask. Um, one of the things which the people in my group at the university actually study is early solar system processes. 
what are the building blocks of our solar system? How did the planets condense uh, at various distances away from the sun? Why do we have rocky planets like mm. Venus, Earth, and mm. Mars mm. close into the sun? And these gas giants further out, and then even further out, the dwarf planets like Pluto. And partly it's to do with the temperature as the early sun started to collapse and produce the, the solar system. You had the heavier elements, iron and silicate rock, condensing first because they've got a, 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 a higher freezing temperature so that these rocks were the first ones to form. And then only when you went further out from the sun did you have the really cold temperatures that would enable not only uh, these exotic hydrocarbons, but also water ice to be condensed. So we've got the gas giants made predominantly out of hydrogen and helium, and their moons made out of water ice, whereas close into the solar system, we have rocky planets and rocky moons like our own moon and the moons of Some Mars. question now. Does that mean that the material in the given object will determine its relative proximity to the sun and to other materials? Uh, it means that if you were to look at any given distance away from the sun, you can be fairly confident you could say what the planets and their moons are most likely to be made of. And some of the other talks we've given over the last year or so, where we're looking at the comets, for example, or Pluto, which is a dwarf planet, they're in very uh, eccentric orbits around the sun. So we're trying to put that piece of the puzzle together. But basically, the big gas giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, had to form further away from the sun because they're made of volatile materials mm. like hydrogen, helium, and water ice, and that sort of thing. Mm. So, so there is some kind of relationship. There's definitely a relationship. Yeah. but. Over the age of the solar system, over the last 4.5, 4.55 billion years, the actual distances that each one of the planets is from the sun could have changed because yeah. they, they've uh, receded or got closer to the sun so that the solar system hasn't remained fixed in its present configuration. It has evolved over a period of time. One would expect that because everything is in motion. And the gravitational attraction, say, of Jupiter has been a major contributor to, say, um, the, the positions of Mars and Earth, as well as it's thrown all of the asteroid belt and some of the comets into disarray over the ages. So, so exciting. It, it's wonderful. Yeah. Before you move on, though, I need to know something that you've mentioned it before. What is this with dwarf planet? Pluto, did you say? It was Pl a Pluto is what, a... What is a dwarf planet? Pluto is a dwarf planet. It's bad nutrition um, or something like yeah, that? Yeah, and, and basically it wasn't being fed by enough of these protoplanetismals, as we call them, uh, to build up a very big rocky planet. So Pluto is a much smaller planet. Um, there's an asteroid or a, a, another dwarf planet called Ceres, which is also quite small, but it's a different designation. And we have that classification now because way out beyond the orbit of Pluto, there are tens, if not hundreds, of other bodies of in, this solar system. in this solar system in places called the Kuiper Belt, for example. K-U-Y-P-E-R. Yeah, where we, we know that there are other objects the size of Pluto or a little bit bigger than Pluto, but instead of being 40 times the distance Pluto is from the sun, these objects might be 60, 80, 100 times further out, and they take thousands of years to go around the sun once. Are they dense? Is, is a dwarf planet well, or a we, planet we, in the Kuiper belt dense? We, we, we do not know for sure. Um, the New Horizons spacecraft is likely to fly past another one of these Kuiper belt objects, probably in 2019. So we'll start to see what the composition and also the shape and what surface history they've had later on. Okay, I All right, let's, you. let's go now back. Now we're going to get on to meters. All thing. right, so let's go uh, on to the third slide, please. And I want to show some results from a European space mission called uh, the, the Huygens probe. Um, 
Huygens landed on the surface of Titan back in 2004. Um, in the lower left-hand side of this picture, you can see the actual probe being assembled uh, in some uh, space laboratory in Europe uh, back in the late 1990s. This is, this is automated and not a person. It's automated. You don't want to send people out to Saturn. Not only is it a long journey, but also you know, they, they couldn't they don't, come they back. They don't come back. <laughs> um, Huygens was carried to uh, the vicinity of Saturn by the Cassini spacecraft, which was a, a, a US spacecraft which is still in orbit around Saturn right now, collecting lots of data. Mm -hmm. But one of the main things about the Huygens probe was that as it was descending through the very, very thick atmosphere of Titan, it was able to take photographs, it, electronic images. And the next slide will show... Before you go, before yeah. I go off that, am I right? Doesn't, doesn't that scene in the laboratory with the, the fellows in the white outfits and everything, doesn't that remind you of a... McDonald's uh, laboratory kitchen that looks like a Big Mac in there. Doesn't that look like a Big Mac? <laughs> um, not really, uh, although I don't really like hamburgers, but still. Um, it, it, it's certainly an object you know, about the same size as this table and uh, you know, uh, a sophisticated piece of equipment. Okay. And as you can see, it was lowered to the surface of Titan by a parachute. Oh, and for the first time, we were able to peer beneath the cloud deck and actually see what the, the surface is. What is the device is. that's over in the right hand, but in the bottom? What is At the that? bottom, that, that is actually the Huygens probe landed on the surface. So, ah, without uh, the parachute. Wi without the parachute. So um, they would jettison the parachute during the terminal phase of landing so that, yeah, just by chance, the parachute could have landed on top of the lander. Uh, the lander was taking images um, when it was on the surface. So you really don't want to have any possibility of it being affected. Yeah, uh, and by the parachute. Yeah, yeah. by okay. the parachutes. Okay, next one. And the next slide will show, this is a view taken from the Huygens probe as it was descending through the atmosphere of Titan. Uh, on the right-hand side, we've got a color mosaic, uh, which basically shows um, what turned out to be a coastline. Recall that we had no knowledge of what the surface of Titan was before Huygens went there. And on the left-hand side, in black and white, we've got a, a set of three images which are showing this coastline, which is sort of running from left center to top right, and then that black squiggly line is actually a river valley. Mm -hmm. and, and this kind of observation was absolutely unexpected because it turns out that Titan has a very similar um, set of processes to the ones which we see here on the Earth. In and, terms of the cutting of and, the river and, valley. And, and we're all familiar with um, clouds, we're familiar with rain, but rainfall when it lands Same on the surface. Of things. It's the same kind of thing, except at a temperature of minus 180 degrees centigrade. And instead of water, the liquid is liquid methane. All right, so we are seeing something which is called a hydrologic system by geologists or uh, earth scientists here on the earth. Titan has a hydrologic system just like the earth, except everything is liquid methane as opposed to liquid water. And the cloud was a cloud methane of methane clouds. gas. It's me methane glass, mm -hmm. and the rain is liquid methane, and it falls on the ground, and it scours the surface, and then it drains down to the uh, low points on the moon, and it forms lakes. And these lakes isn't, are dynamic. Isn't methane the same kind of gas that it smells bad if you're near, a, say, a dairy, a dairy farm. Sure, yes, yeah, yeah. And, on and, that and, note, and, and on that happy note, we're going to take a break. We're going to take a break. Think about it, okay? You're watching ThinkTech Hawaii, Hawaii's leading digital media platform for civic engagement, raising public awareness on tech, energy, diversification, and globalism. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on ThinkTech Hawaii. 
I hope you'll join me each Friday afternoon as we explore the amazing world of science. We bring on interesting guests, scientists from all walks of life, from all walks of science, to talk about the work they do, why they do it, and moreover, why it's interesting to you. What the science really means to your life, its impacts on you, how it's shaping the world around you, and why you should care about it. I do hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. for Likeable Science. Okay, here we are. It's 180 degrees uh, minus, centigrade. Minus, minus 180 degrees centigrade. Correct. It's really cold here on Titan, <laughs> and we're trying to examine exactly how the, the gas works on Titan. Some people say it smells just like methane because it is methane. That's correct, Jay, yes. Right. <laughs> but the consequence of all this liquid methane falling on the landscape of Titan has produced some really interesting landforms. And in our next slide, we will see we have a radar system in orbit around Titan. All right. So on the left-hand side, we're looking down on the north pole of Titan. That's in the middle of the bullseye. And these orange stripes that we see are the radar images as the spacecraft goes past. The brown color is just <coughs> dry land mm -hmm. on Titan, but the blue areas it turns out that there are lakes which are the same size as Lake Superior or Lake Michigan in the continental United States. And what you can see, blue is filled lakes and the light blue and the gray are intermediate and empty lakes. So these are dynamic phenomena. And yeah, these aren't really the colors. No, no, the colors no, that have been assigned the, by the by This the is a computer equipment. rendition, okay. and it's purely done to distinguish so liquids from solids. Yeah. Now, the other thing is that, you know, though you have certain stripes over there that, you, that, the, that the satellite has caught as it goes around the planet. Correct. But other parts have not... Have, not not have been missed. And, and that means that the satellite hasn't been able to take a picture That's of that. That's right. Uh, and I misspoke when I said that there is a spacecraft in orbit around Titan. It's actually in orbit around Saturn. Okay. All right. So on each orbit around oh, I Saturn, see, I see. the spacecraft might actually encounter Titan once or twice per Earth year so, so that we don't have a complete global That's map. why it's irregular. That's because why this, it's irregular. The spacecraft is not going around Titan. It's no, going around it's, Saturn. It's going around Saturn. It catches catch can. And it's, they try and plan the orbits around Saturn so that every time they will encounter Titan or one of the other moons, this moon Enceladus is fabulous because it's got ongoing water volcanism, for example. So it's a competition for where do you collect the data, Titan, Saturn itself, or Enceladus. And so you get little noodles. You can collect it from all places. If we go back to the, um, the, the slide that was on, we can see on the right-hand side, this is a perspective view uh, the dark blue here are, are the liquid lakes, and the lighter blue are the, the partially infilled ones. And the thing about Titan is that it not only has this hydrologic system, but it also is affected season to season. So just as Earth cools down in winter and warms up during the summer, the lakes on Titan change. They are bigger during the summer and the smaller during the winter. And it takes Saturn about 12 Earth years to go once around the sun. So we're seeing this climatological, or the changing climate on Titan, being displayed by the distribution of the lakes. Why is that? That's so interesting. Does it mean that it's not a perfect axis, that the axis is changing as the moon That's goes right. around it's Saturn? The, the, mo the moon is tilted with respect to what's called the plane of the ecliptic. All the planets are in a flat disk yeah. as they go around the sun. Yeah. But as with Earth, which is tilted at 23 and a half degrees, yeah. Earth is yeah. tilted, yeah. Titan is also tilted. And that gives it the and seasons. And that gives it the seasons. How yeah. interesting. So yeah. that really in this solar system, any planet has this, this disparity, this, right. this tilt. And the real cool one is the planet Uranus which is tilted at about 65 degrees. Bigger seasons. 
unbelievable seasons. So that sometimes a season is different from, you know, a, right, a varies by a few Earth years. It's nighttime and it's winter, or it's daytime and it's summer, and it's sort of, but. There's no solid surface on you and us. So, it boggles the yeah. mind, doesn't it? Well, get this. All right. All right so, here we go. So we've got these radar images of methane lakes on Titan. We know that they are changing. All right. If we go to the next slide, this is a high-resolution radar image of a lake on Titan called Kraken. All right. And the scale bar there, that's about 50 miles. C-R-A-C-K-E-N. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, it's from Jason and the Argonauts, right? Ah, and and okay. the dark areas are the liquids and the lighter browns are the land, all right? Mm -hmm. And we know that this is a liquid surface because down at the bottom right-hand corner, <coughs> we've got another image taken from the Cassini spacecraft. Looking back almost towards the sun, you see that little red and white dot subsection subsection that sun glint off of the surface of this lake yeah. so that we know it's super smooth and we can study there we go uh, uh. that is sun glint from our sun all the way you know, uh, from our orbit of Saturn mm. And we're looking at some of these lakes. So the lakes reflect the sun. Just as a mirror would do, yeah. or, or if you're flying in an airplane towards the mainland and you look out yeah. in the direction and there's a bright spot. On, on the ocean. On the ocean. Yeah, yeah. And you can tell what the wind speeds are like on these lakes because rather than being just a single point of light, it's spread out. And that's because it's got waves on the surface. So as with the Earth, you've got weather that is affecting the surface of these lakes. And you want one more surprise? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. This is, this is fabulous. All right, the final slide, the next slide will show us. Not only can we figure out what the surface area is and what the wind speed is from the waves, this combined <coughs> image and the top shows another one of these radar images. And you might just be able to see going from left to right, we've got um, a, da a pair of dashed red lines and a mm. solid red line. Mm. That is what's called the ground track of the spacecraft. Mm. And the spacecraft has a radar that's looking straight down. It's called an altimeter. At the bottom, what we're seeing is the strength of that radar altimeter signal. And what is apparent is that you can detect not only the surface of this methane lake, but you can also measure how deep it is. The radar signal passes through the liquid and then gets reflected back off the bottom. So it's only one reflection, and it's that's only at the one, bottom of the lake. There's a reflection from the top, and there's a reflection, two reflections. two reflections, one from the, the top surface and the other one from the, the, the floor of the lake. So we can figure out how deep these lakes are. We have great knowledge on what the volume of material is, and we can see it sloshing around. You can see it move, yeah. Well, you can make measurements because Cassini has been in orbit around Saturn for the last 12 years. Compare one picture against you another. You can compare one picture to another, and you can get some idea of what the currents are. This is unbelievable. You've got a whole uh, marine environment on Saturn's moon Titan, which is very similar to the Earth, but it's at colder temperatures, and it's made of completely different stuff, and it's eroding the landscape to produce these river valleys, and it's just a marvelous place to go and study. You can learn so much, you know? You, you, you know, like, whatever these instruments can find, you can take them a step further That's and right. find something more, That's something right. else. That's what exploration is all about, because yeah, we try to build a, a, a whole series of models. This uh, slide here shows some hypothetical models of the way that Titan's lakes work, and you've got methane going into the atmosphere with hydrogen and nitrogen, and it starts raining. But only if you send spacecraft either in orbit around Saturn with a radar or the Huygens probe down to the surface 
can we really discover these amazing things? Because there have been some speculation in the past that there would be perhaps um, precipitation out of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. But to my knowledge, nobody was speculating there would be liquid oceans or giant lakes the size of Lake Superior. I mean, this is just but amazing. You couldn't have stuff. that unless the temperature was really low. It has to be really low, and you have to have the thick atmosphere. Um, but given everything else, you're, you're starting to get weather and climate and all of the erosional processes. You know, like people are studying the shapes of the river valleys and uh, trying to see if they're young or whether they've been there for a long period of time and a variety of things related to how the, the, the liquid sloshes yeah. around in the, in the middle of the lake. And, you know, as I said, what the currents are, what the wind speed is, is how the meteorology is influencing uh, these lakes. I mean, this really sounds interesting, but you know, what, you know what strikes me is that this can teach us more about the processes that are happening here on Earth because it's a sort of a common denominator for not only oxygen and hydrogen and all that, and nitrogen, but for all kinds of gases and materials. That's right. So it, we learn more about what's it, happening it, it, in, on Earth, no? What, what, one can take the comparison in a variety of directions. The, the geomorphic process of eroding the landscape and forming lakes is one. You can look at the chemistry. Um, you know, what would Earth be like if it was further away from the sun mm. and much, much colder, for example. Um, we can also compare um, of the different moons of Jupiter and Saturn. Titan is one good example, but there are other moons made out of rock, there's other moons made out of ice. And so the more we explore the solar system, particularly the outer solar system, the more we learn about sort of what the variety is. And that's really important not only for our solar system, but we're now starting to explore and discover many hundreds of planets outside our solar system. They're called exoplanets. And as we explore our own solar system, we realize there's such a huge diversity of the way things look and the way the geologic processes and the chemical processes operate that we're really starting to get a better feel for what might exist on planets around other stars. How, so how, this exciting. must take you away from, from life as we know it. I mean, you know, to, to dwell in this land of, you know, years and years of travel in space and, you know, new phenomenon with the, you know, with the same periodic table and things you never saw or imagined before, and then to have to choose whether you want Rice Krispies or cornflakes <laughs> for breakfast, it, it all... Uh, it certainly all taking you away from uh, everyday life. Yes, uh, I certainly wouldn't watch as much TV if, it, you know, uh, if that was what you're hinting at. But yeah, it, it's just a fabulous place. And, you know, God, God's creation is just wonderful in terms of its diversity. Everywhere we look, it's something new, it's something exciting. And developing the technology and training students to take the next step forwards is re really wonderful. I, I envy, I envy yeah. them and I envy you. And, you know, it almost seems it seems terrible to have to come to an end of this discussion, Peter. Well, I'm sure you know, we'll come back and talk about something else. Reel us back so. in, you know, to the real, to the Earth world. That's the right. World and <laughs> see what it's like. Oh, okay. oh, boring, you know, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Oh, boring. I'd rather be up there. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're Research. more than welcome. <laughs> Research in Menorah.